My name's Colin Marshall. This is the Marketplace of Ideas. My guest is Gail Poole, author of a new book, Faint Praise, The Plight of Book Reviewing in America, that examines the sorry state of book reviewing today and what can be done about it. Gail, welcome to the Marketplace of Ideas. Thank you. You look at book reviews today. What do you see that's wrong? Um, The first problem that I see is the books that we talk about, how we choose books. Um, There are so many books published, and I feel as though we're missing an awful lot of books. We keep, you know, most editors at newspapers and magazines, choose the same books to talk about. And I'd like to see more variety. What are we missing specifically? What kind of things get the most overlooked? Uh, Books from small presses, which don't often have the money to send out galleys and don't have as much money to publicize. Um, Books from university presses, uh, books by unknown writers, books on serious topics that editors feel might be too heavy or serious. (laughs) For readers, uh, they're looking for flashier topics. What gets a little too much press? What books are these ones that we're seeing excessive coverage of? You know, most of the novels are from the same publishers. Not novels. Now, they might be good, but the publisher is is very important in choosing which novels to review. So you have Norton and Sarah Strauss and Dobbs, and um, there are good novels from other places that aren't being chosen uh, because you know, they're unknowns. Now, what do you chalk this up to? Is it a problem with the system as a whole? Is it a systemic thing, or is there is it on the part of the book review editors themselves, or where, do, where does the fault lie? I, I see it in the system. I think that, um, you know, I, I actually am fairly sympathetic to everybody involved in this, because I think that people work pretty hard uh, for very little money. But the system itself is really geared toward what we get. Um, there are so many books, and usually review editors are working on their own. They don't have help even in choosing books, and hundreds of books come in. And they, they choose by publisher or by author. They're all going to review Philip Roth's new book. So, you know, we'll get lots of reviews of the same Philip Roth book. And it's not that we should ignore Philip Roth's book, but it does mean that we're, all, we're going to get the same reviews everywhere. Um, it does come down to the editor, but he, it's also... You know, he, he or she is working for the publisher of the newspaper or magazine, and they're usually, especially at newspapers, they're very, they don't have a lot of space. And, you know, book reviewing is usually really at the low end of the totem pole in a newspaper. It's not news. And they don't want to waste space, so they don't want books that might get negative reviews. They want something that will, you know, sort of connect with the most readers. Now, tell me about your own experience but as far as writing book reviews and editing book reviews as well. What did you find when you were in the trenches there, so to speak? Well, you know, it's interesting. When I first began, I began a long time ago, uh, back at the end of the 70s, as editing a small press newspaper uh, magazine. And I really, you know, like most people, came into it knowing nothing. I, um, I, I did find that I think we, it was probably pretty haphazard the way we chose books. And I think that's probably not uncommon. There's a haphazardness about it. I found that as I reviewed, I mean, there were a lot of different kinds of reviewing that that I did. And when I was reviewing first fiction for The Plain Dealer, it was really the best situation because I would get cartons of books. Um, She would send me all first novels or whatever. And I actually, you know, as a columnist, I would really read through them and make choices. If you don't have someone doing that, she, you know, the editor couldn't possibly read those books. She would have to have columnists doing it. Now, about that difference between being a columnist versus a freelancer, what was the difference in experience there? What was the difference in how the job actually worked, for better or worse? Well, I think it was much, much better from my perspective. I mean, it was, it was a job, and you knew that there would be a carton of books coming. You were going to choose a certain number of them. Uh, and, but if there were good ones, you could choose more. And you, were in, you, know, you, you knew your editor pretty well, so there, there was a correspondence, as opposed to freelancing where, you know, you come in and you do one every couple of months. It's not the same kind of rapport with the editor. I mean, there's a bad side to columnists, which is that, you know, if, if a reader doesn't like the columnist, they're kind of stuck with that columnist. 
So I, I always felt you really should have you know, rotating columnists. Um, but it, it's a much more, it, it's much better. You get to know a field as a columnist. You're not, uh, you, you can compare what you're reading this month with what you've read other months, other years. You, you really do know the field. And I, I mean, part of, part of the problem, I mean, it was, I mentioned the one problem of how many books and choosing books, but there's also, I, I think, the question of whether the reviewers are, are qualified to review what, what they're reviewing. Now, your column was, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was first novels? This particular column. I, I had several different columns. I reviewed travel literature for the Christian Science Monitor. And there, too, they would send me a carton of, you know, lots of books, and I could choose what I thought was important or what I could relate to. So I, I also reviewed mysteries at one point, and that was another column for a library publication, which is also very different. You know, each kind of publication is, is so different because for libraries, so they're choosing for a wide variety of people, and you're really trying to say, should this book be in a library? <laughs> not, not just, is it you know, good or bad? Or... Now, with your experience editing, what did you learn when you were in the editor's position? Well, I think I, I learned that you, you know, there were people you could really rely on to do a good job, <laughs> and it, it was very hard. I mean, I did try to get the same, not, not columnists, but the same people reviewing uh, all the time, so that you you knew who you could turn to, and who would be reliable. And it was very difficult to find people like that. I mean, one of the problems I think was just having enough time. I I couldn't read books before I sent them out. So often I I wouldn't know if they really were worth a review. I just I wouldn't have had the time for that. And again, with a reliable reviewer, they they might tell you this isn't worth a review, whereas others, you know, they might just review it anyway, which would be kind of unfortunate with so little space. What surprised you about the job of editing? How many bad books are published? Really? Um, yes. I mean, you know, books that, you know, really, but there are books you, you wouldn't have heard of. You know what I mean? There a lot of stuff. There's so many, I mean, 150,000 books. And so you're, you have some things that are, it's amazing that they get published. There were a lot of books that were, that are essentially invisible to the reading public that yes. you saw all of them. Well, I didn't see all of them. I mean, it's really, I'm, exa it's, I'm not exaggerating in terms of the number, but those books, most of those books will be not even sent out because they're textbooks or, you know, something not for general review. But there are really a lot of books. <laughs> and, you know, you don't see them all, but you see a lot. <laughs> How does that sheer flow of books get dealt with? How did you manage that stream? Not very easily. I mean, they're heavy. <laughs> And, you know, just op <laughs> opening these, these book mailers. And, in fact, I know I have a friend who said that he, there was some, some publisher would shrink wrap his books, and he said he finally refused to open them. <laughs> and he, he sent them back. I, um, it, it was very difficult. It was really very hard to do that. I mean, if it was at the Plain Dealer, it was much easier because she dealt with the real bulk of it, and I would just get one carton out of however many that she was dealing with. But this is where your editor would have the bulk of the books yes, sent to the her, and then you'd, would, yeah. it would come down to you with a, with a more uh, refined selection, yeah. you might say. Yeah. She did remove some of them, yes. I mean, yeah. But at least she'd opened the book mailers, and, and it was a little bit more, you know, it was easier to deal with. But, but dealing with the flow of books is, is actually a, it's a big issue for editors. There are so many. It's very overwhelming. Now, how do these systemic issues manifest themselves in the book reviews that a reader is going to be reading in their newspaper or magazine? Well, you know, there, there are a, a lot of pressures on a reviewer. I mean, I'm not sure that reviewers are all aware of all the pressures. I think it was only when I wrote about reviewing, and this was actually an article I did back in the 80s, that I began to be really aware of all the pressures. Because I, I think that I know there are publications that want negative reviews, but for the most part, editors really don't want very negative reviews because, I mean, at a, at a newspaper, they, the publisher of the paper doesn't want to feel that he's wasted space and he says, well, if this wasn't a good book, why are we reviewing it? It might be an important book that deserves a negative review, but he doesn't want that. And I think that most reviewers are aware of, of this and we, we even think of this as fair, you know, I, I mean, it isn't, but we do, I, we do think of positive as being fair. So there's a bias toward positivity there in the first place. There, there is. I mean, I think that there is for a lot of reasons. I think it's in our culture. I think we have a very strong sense of, you know, if you don't have something good to say, don't say anything. I think we, 
deal. Oh well, it's a book. We should, we ha- and you certainly you should give it respect as a book. I I don't question that at all. But I think that there's some over over respect that given, and that you have to find what's good. And I certainly felt that if you said something positive, you didn't need to back it up. <laughs> but if you said something negative, you needed to back it up. And sometimes you really didn't have space to back it up. And would leave that out uh, because you didn't have the room for it, and if you couldn't explain it, it seemed you shouldn't even put it in, because they're really most reviews. I mean, it's in the New York Review of Books, they have endless space, but in a newspaper, there's not endless space at all. I mean, sort of short reviews of 500 words, you, you can't say very much. So that most most of the pressures are going toward making reviews more positive. I think. So there's a a bias away from saying anything negative. There's a bias away from evidence because there's not the space to include it. Are those the yeah. main problems or are there some more that... It's interesting. I think that the problems in book reviewing go back to the beginning. They're the same... Pro- I, I know everyone is talking about the decline, but I actually felt that the problems have been the same. That the system has not actually, until now maybe, on, online, it hasn't changed very much. And the problems have been the same. And I, I think that you know they come down to basically... Which books do we choose, and can we open ourselves up to choosing more books uh, than a greater variety of books? Um, can we make sure that whoever is reviewing the book is competent to review it? And and then, sort of, how do they review it? The issue of, you, you know, it, it should a review should be an essay where you really do dis- you describe it. Too many reviews don't describe a book. I mean, a really good description of a book, and then some sort of uh, and a comment an evaluation of the book. And I think of those as, obviously, I want something more than that. I want something interesting exactly. written. Uh, I want it to be engaging, or I'm not going to read a dry, you know, sort of report. But, but those seem to me minimal. They should be part of it, and a good writer will turn it into something more interesting. The reviewer, as writer, will turn it into a, a, an interesting little essay. But I think that often there's not a description of the book. I, I find this over and over. I sort of, what is the book that, that you're talking about? That's the, sort of the third part. How do reviewers actually review books? And I, I think there are problems sort of at, at each level. And again, I think this comes down to editors, book review editors, not not editing. Most of them don't seem to edit reviews. The editor isn't doing the the very title of their job. They're not. No, I, they just really most of them don't. I mean, I think again, there's a question of time. They don't have time. I think there's some feeling in this field. And I've seen this in, in, in discussions about, about my book, actually. Say, well, there aren't rules. You know, there aren't rules for reviewing. And that's certainly true. There aren't rules. But there should be standards. And I think that this, the field itself, people in the field, resist this very much. You know, they, they keep saying, well, it all comes down to taste. Well, y- your opinion of the book comes down to taste. But a review is, does not in itself just come down to taste. The I mean, book reviewing field kind of clings to the anything goes mindset. Then I, I think that there's a lot of that. Um, you know, there's just such a resistance to the sense of, it, of, of this rules idea. Which, as I said, I agree. You can't have rules. I mean, it, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't make sense because every book sort of calls for its own kind of review. You mentioned the book review, crit- the criticism of book reviews through the ages, and in the book. You give quotes going back to I want to say the 18th century. Are they are they that old? Yeah, the well, almost. Uh, yeah, the it's actually the beginning of the 19th century, but pretty much as soon as book reviewing began, there were a lot of complaints about it. And I, I it's fascinating because this is obviously a field that has been lambasted forever. Are they the very same problems today that they were then? Yeah, yeah, they really are. I mean, well. At least from the descriptions of the problems, uh, yes. Uh, they, even this, you know, how everybody complains that in a review they often end up, you know, despite these minor flaws, um, this book is outstanding, or <laughs> having described terrible flaws. You know, there's no plot, and the prose is terrible, and uh, and you know the characters aren't believable. Despite these minor flaws, <laughs> this is an outstanding novel. Well, even that used to be done, and people complained about it. And it's very interesting that these traditions go way back. Because I, I, I sort of see it as partly, I think, reviewing, well, it's, it's very difficult to review well. And I, I think there are inherent problems. But there are these traditions about the way reviews are written. And 
they have been around for a long time, and I think there are a lot of bad traditions. What are the hardest to break of these bad habits that book reviewers have gotten into for these hundreds of years? Well, I, I think it is this un- unwillingness to be, I don't know if I want to say detached, but un- unwillingness to, well, to, to really be more honest. And I think it's the difficulty of finding the right tone almost because you see nasty reviews, but I don't think, I don't personally think nasty is particularly good. We don't really have a very good critical basis in this country. I don't think we learn how to to criticize well, because there is a good way of being fair and and moderate in what you say, but looking at a book and and really giving an analysis of it and an honest opinion. And we seem to have a great deal of trouble finding the the, the way to do this. When you um, say you say in this country. Is it better in others? Well, I I th- you know I I think that uh, in England they have past on it better, but they get very nasty. I, they certainly have much more vitriolic reviews there, which we don't have much of here. But I think that, a, you know, I, I do think a publication like the, the TLS, the Times Literary Supplement, is, is much better than anything we have here. And I think that they do a good job of selecting a wide range of books. And some of them are very academic, but a lot of them aren't. They do mysteries also and novels. And they make literature interesting. They make books interesting in a way that we seem to have trouble doing. We treat books more as objects that come through the mailroom that we need to... No, I think we tend to be very promotional. Yeah. I mean, it's really promotional. And, you know, even with the praise, I mean, we, we, we can't say it's a good book. You have, it's, it's like this, oh, this inflation of, you know, it's a superb book. It's you know, remarkable, astonishing, stunning. The vocabulary is... Uh, and it's very much in place. The vocabulary doesn't change. I do think that this goes back a long way in this, in this country. That because I, I certainly uh, back Antioch Review was talking about back in the '40s of uh, reviewing being an arm of of, the, of uh, publishing, you know, and publicists. I do think it's very American that a sense that you're you're selling a book rather than reviewing a book. Is there an issue here, or is this an issue of? not treating literature in itself as important? Well, that's a good question. I, it could be that they are related, that we haven't really, uh, because I, I, I do think that probably in England it was treated as more serious than early on, and it could be. I'll have to think about that because it could be why. One of the main themes in your book is who is competent to be a book reviewer, and that's what I want to ask you. Who is competent to review a book? That is a, is a very interesting question because right now with the online reviewers, the print reviewers are saying online reviewers are not competent. But I really think that there are, there are no credentials for this field. People go into it. They think that, and I, I, went, I started reviewing. What, what were my credentials? What, was it, what were any of these print reviewers' credentials? They didn't have any credentials because they don't exist. And it depends what you're reviewing. If it's fiction, you should be widely read and you should you know, really be widely read in, in literature. And I think that there is a real talent that some people have for writing reviews. It's not just the criticism, but also the ability to, to, to describe a book. Not everybody can do that. And they may be great novelists, but standing outside the book and saying what it is is actually very difficult. And there are, just, there are people who are good critics, and I think what, that as they begin reviewing... Some people have a talent for it. Uh, they turn out to be gifted critics. And they also can say why something works or it doesn't work. Those really are the credentials. Who working today doing book criticism do you think has those credentials? Who is doing the best book reviewing in your eyes? I, I like Daniel Mendelssohn a lot and Michael Durda. I mean, there are people who I think are, are very good reviewers. It's such a personal field. I don't want to say this... But, one person is good and one isn't so much and as just to look at the issues overall. Uh, but there are certainly good, good practitioners. I, I think many more people are credentialed. I think, unfortunately, it, the field doesn't work the way. Ideally, I think you, know, you could get a job reviewing if you had this talent, but very, uh, very few people can actually make a living as reviewers. If you could... I don't know if impose is the right word, but if you could put down some basic standards for the field, what would you put down? I would like to see publications have guidelines for reviewers. 
and I know some publications do have these, but not, not very many, which really do say, just sort of lay out what, it will vary from one publication to another what they actually want. But I think they, sh they should say that there should be a description of the book and an evaluation of the book. I think that there should be, you know, an encouragement to, to be fair, not to be, not to be nasty, but to be honest. And not to speak as though you're some voice on high, but to really engage with the book, which is what a review should be, and what a reader what, what it's what becomes most interesting. I, I think there was an editor who said that to me at some point, and it really it freed me, you know, because I didn't feel that I needed to be the objective voice saying what this book, you know, really is for all time, but rather just it is my opinion of it. But you have to back up what you say. I mean, it, it, it is an essay. And, I, I would like to see guidelines also saying that if you do have any conflict of interest, you shouldn't be reviewing the book because often there is a conflict of interest. But we don't really know about it. You know. How often does that happen where there is a conflict of interest where you, you may see someone reviewing the book of a friend or of an enemy even? How, how many times do you think that happens and it goes under the radar of the reader? Often it, enough, but I think there are other kinds of conflicts of interest. You know, for, for example, when... Uh, that, that Maureen Dowd book was reviewed by someone who, I, I doubt that she, was, she wasn't a friend or an enemy, but she, uh, the reviewer was someone who she had knocked a, a couple of years earlier in one of her columns and who then took, <laughs> took revenge and gave her a bad review. I, I think more often than we know, but it's very hard to know uh, unless, you, <laughs> it's very hard to know. Readers certainly don't know when anything is, Unless they, they're, unless it's disclosed in the review, or when people write letters in complaining, but I think that there's there's a fair amount of this. I don't think there's so much at, in local papers, but I think at places you know where names are more important, there's a lot of schmoozing that goes on, and I don't see that as such as as major an issue as as a question of competence, actually, because that one, I mean, it's like, I don't see why novelists, for example, are reviewing fiction. Novelists receive preference in this uh, in book reviewing, you think, and you don't see why? Uh, most novelists are not good critics, and the reviews aren't really very good. And they seem to think if you if you write novels, you can criticize novels. But I, you know, I taught writing for a long time, and, and the skills you know of, of writing fiction and critiquing are very different skills. I, they're not the same. So th those are the those issues I think are very important for the kinds of reviews that we get. What's the difference? between the ideal nonfiction reviewer and the ideal reviewer of fiction. They're not the same person, I take it. No. What, what is the difference? In nonfiction, you usually need subject expertise. You have to have somebody who, who knows. I, I thought this was uh, very interesting, this case that's just come up with Robert Frost's notebooks. I, I was yeah. just in the Times. where They were published by Harvard University Press last year. And were why I, they were well reviewed, and now someone has checked. Uh, it was the transcription of his notebooks. And now somebody checked and said, in the four, first four notebooks, there were a thousand mistakes. No. <laughs> well, of course, a review. I mean, nobody seems to have caught this. None of the reviewers caught it. Well, in this case, even if you were an expert in Robert Frost, you you wouldn't have known. But it it matters that no one even caught it. You know, and you wonder how can this be? I, I, the only way you could have solved it would be if reviewers had enough time to go and check, spot check. If there were a thousand mistakes, they probably, even with spot checking, they would have found them. And, of course, I wish we could allow for this kind of time. But, anyway, you do need subject expertise, so that if someone's reviewing a biography of Teddy Roosevelt, then they should know something of the history of, of the time. I mean, and I, I don't, they should have read other biographies, they should know something, or I don't know that era, and I don't... What, what would I say? It's well written, <laughs> but, but what if it's all wrong? You can't judge the actual, the actual ideas in it. Then you're only competent to judge the prose, right. essentially. I mean, so you need subject expertise. I think in fiction reviewing, some people have, uh, you know, they they really do have they have good taste, <laughs> and they know how to write about fiction, and those are very delightful reviews to read. I mean, you know, it's uh, I I think it's the subject then is is fiction that they can write about, but I. So it's subject to expertise in some sense, but I, I should add that you're going to have much more variation in taste in fiction than you will in nonfiction. You know, I, I think that if a nonfiction book is inaccurate, 
will all agree that if they know that it's inaccurate. Whereas a lot of people like innovative novels or conventional novels, or this taste varies so much, and and that I I think is the, you know, from from the writer's perspective, it's just the luck of the draw. Is it important then for a reviewer of fiction for their tastes to be generally known to the audience? Yes, which is another reason I thought columnists work out better, because you know, oh, well, this is a columnist who just doesn't like this kind of novel, and, and you can probably not take their, their opinion that seriously and look elsewhere. And I think that it's also it's important for the reviewer to somehow let the reader know what his taste is in an individual review. I mean, if they say, I, I have an aversion to innovative novels, so I didn't like it. I mean, I think you should not review it, or you should make it clear that you don't like this style. And, and so that way, if I like innovative novels, I can read the review that says, I hate innovative novels, and I think, well, okay, I'll pick this book up, because the guy hates them, and he hated this book, so maybe I'll like it. Right. I mean, because you should describe it well enough so that a person, the reader, feels... They have some sense of what the book is and that they might want to read it, even if you didn't like it. Your thoughts about academics doing criticism, academics versus non-academics. Who, who makes the better book reviewer, generally? Academics who write jargon are unreadable, so I, nobody would want this. But there are many academics who they have to be able to write well for a general audience. I, they are. I, I, I think you've hit on the, 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 uh, an important point because usually they're the people who have the subject expertise, but they often can't really write well. And I think, I, you know, between the two, I, I, who knows? I mean, what I'd love to see is people who reviewed, as I said, as an occupation, who who did really gain depth, but they were good at writing for a general audience. Tell me if I have the accurate idea here, but. In your ideal world, you would want to see a professional class of book reviewers. Book reviewing is their job, and they, of course, they know how to write, but they primarily know how to review, and that's what they do. Yeah, I, w- I would like to see that. I don't think I ever would. But yes, we, if we took books seriously enough, uh, that is what you need. You need people who don't just sort of bop in to say something, but rather think about books all the time, it seems to me, and what a good book is and are actually paid to do it. I mean, enough so that it's not $100. I mean, they're paid to put the time in that it takes to actually see if it's if the book is accurate, read it carefully, read it twice, not just sort of rush through it. Yes, I, I think that that has been... Uh, uh, many people have wanted that for a long time, but I, it's, not, it's not the way we're headed. So book reviewing in this day and age, or I guess maybe always, yeah. is, is essentially a hobby then? It's treated that way. I think it's sort of forced to be without money behind it. I don't think that I ever saw it as a hobby. I took it, you know, and I think, you know, it is changing right now in terms of print reviews being cut back so much. But I think people who did it seriously really did, we did it, you know, as an occupation. What do you think are the effects of the Internet on all this? I think it's been fascinating what's happening because the you know, reviews are being cut back in newspapers right now, but there are a lot of reviews on, online. And there was something of a battle this past year between the print reviewers and the bloggers, and the print reviewers claiming that you know the bloggers didn't know what they were doing, and the bloggers calling the print reviewers old-fashioned. And <laughs> I, sort of, I don't know. I, I think there are some very good blogs and very good reviews, some very good reviews online. I think it's right now... It, it, the, the problem, it, partly, is that I don't see blogging as a system that can replace reviewing. It's too, uh, you know, you read about a book here and a book there, and you're hopping around so much. I mean, because any one blogger can only review a couple of books. You spend your lifetime reading reviews <laughs> you, just to find, you know, 10 reviews. It would take forever. And also, there are no editors online. And I think it's very important to have editors <laughs> What blogs do you like? Well, I think the Complete Review is really a very, it's a very good site all, all around. They have a, a blog which is with, with news, and they also have reviews, and they're very scrupulous. They're very, they're very good. It's a solid blog, and I, I like them very much. And I, I, I like quite a few of them, but some are, are you know, since anything does go, I, you know, there's, there's anything from terrific to terrible. Scruples, now, is that what brings a, a good blog above the rest? 
I think they also have good taste. And, and they, they actually focus a lot on international literature. So they're trying to get to things that aren't being reviewed elsewhere. But I do think I think being scrupulous matters a lot. And I, again, I don't, you know, I, I don't want reviews to be boring. <laughs> That's not my goal at all, because I don't like to read boring reviews. But I think being scrupulous is important. Reviewers need to read very carefully and, and try to say as precisely as they can what's going on in the book and try to figure out what the author was trying to do. In the book, you bring up Amazon.com reviews especially. And, and what effect yeah. do you think those have? Unfortunately, I think that they do have an effect, and I think that that's kind of worrisome because I feel there, I, I, unless it changes, that it hasn't been very ethical. A lot of reviews were written by friends and by enemies. I, I saw a wonderful book. I thought it was wonderful. That got only with one re, one star review from someone who I thought it was clear it was some disgruntled former student of hers, <laughs> <laughs> and I think that people pay attention to that. Should it be there, this one star on, <laughs> with a very good book? I, if you get enough reviews, the one star disappears. But uh, this was a, an academic book that wasn't going to get very many reviews. And I, so I, I do have difficulty with this because I think it's just misused. You'd like to see a little more weeding out of the reviews that are clearly not, shall we say, objective. That may be the wrong word, but that are very far away from object objective. I don't think that they can know. I mean, Amazon can't really know. By its very nature, then, it's, that's the yes. issue. There were a lot of things in the system. I mean, they're rewarding reviewing a lot of times. They're encouraging very quick things. And most of these aren't reviews. They're comments, because a review really has to be a little bit more than what most of these are. But I think that the system just lends itself to becoming unethical. But I don't see that Amazon can check on everybody. But I, I do think that people pay attention. I mean, I think it can affect sales. It's not something that doesn't matter, but I don't see what, what could be done about it. As far as print publications, who do you think is doing the best job in this country? I think Book Forum is doing a good job. You know, I, I don't think the newspapers are, but some of the magazines, I think Book Forum is probably... Since you mentioned Book Forum, I, I like it as well, but what do, you, what do they give you that the other publications fail to? Well, I think there's more, more depth. I, I think that uh, there's Certainly in the Times, I, I'm not sure what it is about it, that they're just something that is not serious about it. You know, I, that's not the right word, but I, I think it's the, the, sen the sense that this matters, <laughs> that literature matters, or, or that books matter. Because it's not all literature, but just books. I mean, when you're going to review them, there should be some sense that it matters not just for sales. Do you think that book reviews could go extinct? Is that actually a possibility? Not from what I'm seeing online. I'm seeing many, many reviews, and that's why I feel, and there are, I think what's more likely going to happen, I don't know with newspapers because the issue there isn't really book reviews, but newspapers themselves are having so much trouble that we don't really know what's going to happen to newspapers. I mean, they may take review sections online. That's a possibility. I, I, I don't know. I think that there will be magazine-like arrangements online. Oh, there's now an internet review of books just started up, and I know that Nan Talisi is planning a book review online. Uh, that w I think she wanted the book forum editor to edit it. I, you know, there are plans. It's hard to see book reviewing going extinct. I mean, but a lot of the, the blogs that are doing better reviews, well, the reviews don't look very different from print re reviews. So I, I don't see that they'll go extinct. You do see potential in the Internet, then. Even if it doesn't quite happen in print, there's always going to be that forum on the Internet? I, I think right now, on What's unfortunate is that it's just such a mass of opinion on, on the Internet. It's not organized in, in any way for readers to find. Well, you can find what you like, obviously, but, but it's still a lot of it is just expressing, you know, like, I like this, I don't, you know, without the sense that you're supposed to explain why, which I think is what a review should do. But there are certainly people reviewing like that online, and I hope that if it does move online, that it will be better than what we've had in print. <laughs> I actually have found in the discussions of reviewing this year that the bloggers were very interested in the issues of reviewing, more so than what I saw in, in most of the print uh, in review sections. You know, I, I didn't see a lot of discussion. And online, I did. A lot of, some of the people have go, who have gone into blogging have been very frustrated with what they've seen in print. And I think they hope to do better. And it's been mostly in the blogosphere that they've 
the term the crisis in book reviewing has been thrown around. And yeah. I, don't, I don't know, do you agree that there is a unique crisis now? Because as we've talked about, it's always been viewed as been in decline, the book reviewing business. Yeah. Yes, I, I would not say it's in, in more of a crisis, except it's, it's changing because it won't be in newspapers, or it isn't right now. The newspapers are cutting back on this. But I see the problems as being very much the same. And online, they face the same issues. Do we talk about a, a blogger has the same issue of choice? of books and how they talk about them. Will they be fair? Will they describe books? I, you know, the issues are not different online. And I, I think that this crisis is really about newspaper reviewing, which is only one place for, new, for reviews to appear. And why the focus on newspapers, do you think? Well, there was a time when they did, they certainly were the, most people who, who sort of the general public, I think, got their reviews mostly from newspapers. Uh, they've been cut back now cutting back since for more than a decade. I mean, it began a long time ago. It's just been cutting back much more now. But those reviews reached the most people. Suddenly, I guess it's, it's reached a point where I know the NBCC felt, oh, that this is a real crisis. There's been a theme here of book selection you know, right there in the first place. Do most problems stem from that issue of what books do we pick out? Yes. If we really had a different selection policy, we would have better reviews. They're, if they're chosen because, you know, the topic is hot, you know, or something, rather than because it's a good book, th then the reviewer is up against writing about a book that is not actually a good book. And it's very hard to write a, 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 a good review of a book that is not itself worth reviewing. Do you think if editors themselves were given time to read the books that they think should be considered, would that improve things? Well, it would, but they really can't. I, but I do think, I, I would like to see an exchange of information between the editors and the reviewers so that the reviewer reads the book, but if the reviewer says, you know, this really, it, it's not, it's not worth it. There are some books, as I said, that are important, even if they're not, maybe they don't work, maybe they don't succeed, but they should be talked about. There. But some just, really, it, they shouldn't be. It's just, there's no point to it. And I, I think that they should return those books and not review them. But I'd like to see a dis more discussion between editors and reviewers. I, I never really felt that I had that discussion. You know, editors were busy. And I, as an editor, probably, I did talk to, pe I talked to the reviewers all the time, it seemed. But I don't think we really did discuss the books enough. And it seemed like there, there wasn't time for it. The book reviewers you've talked to, have they felt that they were unable to talk to their editors, or were they just unwilling to, or what was blocking them from engaging in that discussion? It was a combination. I think most editors that I've worked with didn't really welcome much conversation. They didn't have time. There was a lot at newspapers. There was always a rush, and actually at magazines too. I think you know there was a sense that you were kind of on your own. I don't think that they welcomed books being sent back either. Um, I. I did do that a couple of times, and actually it was fine. At, at, at the Women's Review, which, because it was a monthly, it, it was a slower process. There, I think they would have welcomed it more, but I think it's a question of time. It always is a, it's a, it's a very rushed business, it felt like, which is strange, given, I mean, it shouldn't really be so rushed. It's book reviewing, I mean, it's not breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> it was always, everybody was very busy. Editors were, were overworked, there's no question, but I, I think if they should be more dialogue. I do think that some, I, I think editors, some, certainly some editors I worked with didn't want to be bothered having discussions like this, I know. And I think that reviewers often, well, I, I hate to say it, but I, one of the things I think I said it in the book too was you leave it for so long, you know, you don't get to the review until it's actually too late <laughs> to return it. And it's, you know, it would be very unprofessional three days before your deadline to say, I can't, I'm not going to do this or something. I'm, Sorry, here's the book back. Yeah, I, I think you, if you're, or, you have to be, organized. it has to be already a system where you say, maybe an editor would say, look, read through this. If you think it's worthwhile, let me know and we'll review it. And, you know, you, these things could be done, but they're, they're not done. <laughs> what do you think of the reaction that your book has gotten? Like online, for example, there's been a lot of talk about it. What do you make of what's been said about it? Well, I, I've been pretty happy about all the attention. I, and I did feel that the, the bloggers actually, I, I liked those reviews a lot. I, I felt that they took it, they took reviewing very seriously. And I thought that their criticisms were, were valid also. And I even saw a few people, a few bloggers saying that 
they were looking more carefully at the way they wrote reviews, which would be really nice if this had an, an impact. You, you never know whether something, you know, but that was the point of, of writing, hope, hoping that people would, would maybe think about how books are reviewed. The book also got a lot of attention when a review by James Wolcott in the, yes. in the New Republic was uh, brought onto Powell's Review a Day. And I just know. looking at the, uh, looking through the eyes of a book review evaluator, what would you, what would you say about that review? And for those of you playing the home game, you can still find it if you search for Powell's Review a Day, and it's there. Yes, I know. It, it was all over the web. There were actually two times this was all over the web. The first was when uh, Book Daddy, you know, I don't know if yeah, you exactly. saw that review, yeah, that one. And then the, the Walcott review was was everywhere. And, well, I you know, it was a lot of space that, that went to the book. I, I don't know that he described the book because I was really, I, I wish he, he had said that I was trying to explain the way the whole system worked. I, but I think that it was, it was a very, it was a fun review to read, a great deal of fun. It was very entertaining. I, it's very hard to respond to your own reviews. I've yeah. been very interested in, in watching this happen, you know, so being reviewed has, has been very interesting. It was a performance. Yeah, you could say that. I, I had a hard time at first reading it, telling whether it was positive or negative. I've settled on positive. I don't know if you've felt the same way. I think you couldn't tell. I think that most of it was positive. And then at the end, he said this thing about, you know, he actually was naming performance reviews. That's what he likes. It was actually positive. But it's hard. When you arrange a review, if you end on a positive note, everyone feels that the review was positive. And if you end with a down thing, everyone feels it was negative, even if 90% of the review was positive. It's very interesting. So 90% of the review was positive, and he was agreeing with me. But since he didn't in the end, it felt negative. What are your thoughts on the performance review, the grand sort of virtuoso review by you know, a big-time reviewer who yeah. uh, puts on a show, essentially? I, you know, I am not so fond of them. I, I actually, but if, if they, you can't have a whole, you can't have all book reviews like that because I mean, they're endlessly long in their performance. And you, I, it's not, it's not actually my favorite kind of reviewing. I, I would rather see um, more in, interesting, or you know, sort of, I don't want to say run of the mill, but general treatment of reviewing. Sort of up, uplifted rather than the performance reviews, but they can be fun. There's no question. And I mean, I, I think that some of the things that he mentioned were actually essays and not reviews. Certainly, Philip Larkin, as I remember it, there wasn't a new Barbara Pym book that had come out. He was just discussing the work of Barbara Pym, and it was a wonderful essay. And, and he got people reading Barbara Pym, which was great. I, but I think the performance, the, the problem with the performance review is that it's much more about the performer than the book. And I have a real feeling about book reviewing that it should be about the book. <laughs> that takes the focus away from the very thing it's meant to focus on, then. Yes, yeah. I mean, I, don't, I, I think it's, it's, it's fun to read them, so, but, but, you know, it should be a, about the book. This is a, a subject that you explicitly deal with in the book, but I want to phrase it as a question for you. Why do book reviews matter? And they, they matter I sort of in two ways. One, just as a, as a guide to what to read. I, with, with everything there, I really... And, and not enough time to read all of it. Uh, I really do want to find out what is worth reading. The second thing is that I think that reviews draw attention to certain books and topics. They clearly do. They still do. I know people are now saying reviews, as some people have said they don't matter, but certainly I've seen this with my book. If this didn't get reviewed, nobody would know about it. Reviews can certainly point to certain issues that we should be thinking about or interesting or that are, are out there. And without reviewing, I don't see how you're going to, we could find out about what's being published with some kind of guided finding out, not just the titles. And without that, I just see a, a mass of, of titles, basically. I mean, of books in print where you just sort of know the titles of things and, and nothing about them. If you think reading matters, then, as I do, uh, or, you know, that books matter, then reviews matter uh, in terms of, sort of drawing attention to a lot of books that we should be looking at. You'd say they set a reading agenda? Yeah, yeah, they set a reading agenda. I mean, they at least, uh, you know, would point to things that you, uh, there's so many, and I you know, hope for a lot of variety, that you as a reader might be interested in looking into. I mean, I like reading reviews of books that I don't, I'm not going to read. But I do want to know what's, what is out there, what's, what is happening in a field. 
I may not have time to go into that field. Natural history, for example, I, I find I do read the reviews of those books, and if they're good reviews, they do let me know what's going on in that field. And, and sometimes I do go on and read the books, even though it's not, it's not my field. I mean, it's sort of a reading. But uh, I think that anybody interested in natural history would want to know what's, what's out there. And I, I think that without book reviews, I, d I don't really see how this can happen. I don't see another way. If you could change one element of book reviewing, what would that be? It would be book selection. It would be book selection. I, I would really like to see editors choosing a wide variety of books, if, if that counts. If that's, if that's the, It certainly does count. Uh, I, I would really like to see them looking at, you know, just different kinds of books and, and different publishers publishing, you know, and, and international books, too, including that, including that in selection, because we just don't get to see any of these. They're translated, but they're not reviewed, and no one even knows they're there. The book, once again, is Faint Praise, The Plight of Book Reviewing in America. Gail Poole, thank you so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you. Our music is composed by Ben Althaus. Check out his website, Ben Althaus, that's B-E-N-A-L-T-H-O-U-S-E dot com. For more information and our online show archive, visit Colin Marshall Radio dot com.